All right, Vicki. Okay. Good evening, good evening, everyone. My name is Vicki Knuth and I will be your moderator this evening for our, our Green Bay Zoom class. This is a school and not a church and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in 1958. We hold classes throughout the United States, Canada and certain other foreign countries. The Green Bay branch was established in 1975. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the School in Green Bay, Dr. Andy Bukaterin, and our president, Dr. Michael Josephson. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim, it has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that every Lord must have a name and every God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, Greek, nor Latin languages have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in this pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe I set them out there last Vicky, night. Vicki, Vicki, oh. you got muted, but uh, Carl, thank you, Carl. Vicki, you're muted. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Okay, um, where did I leave off that I got muted? Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in this pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, he took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walk the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah. 
whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. We have 10 primary constitutional aims or objectives, and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern, both practical and occult science. Five is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10 is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of a mortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. I have an announcement before I give the rest of the information. This uh, Tuesday, the 4th of July, we will not be having a Zoom class. We will be have an in-person class. And our speaker, our uh, prayer this evening will be by Pam Ullman of the Green Bay Branch. We'll have a song selection. And our scripture reading is 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Let's all bow our hearts and minds and ask Yahshua to help the brethren that are going through hard times. Let's thank him for everything he's shown us and everything he's going to show us. And with that, let's all say hallelujah. 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 No, I won't fall away. I won't stand in the middle. I will always keep the faith. For my Yahweh cannot stand. Fidelity and my Elohim is the only ill for me. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, ooh. No, I won't turn away. I won't. this world I won't 
cheat myself of everlasting life for the love Yah gives to me is my liberty and my Elohim is the only El for me. When I feel that I just can't go on And every ounce of strength is gone I remember that he's always there To comfort me And when I feel this life is just too tough And the burdens won't let me lift my feet I remember that his love is enough for me Is just enough for me. No, I won't fall away. I won't stand in the middle. And my Elohim is the only air for me. I'll be reading the um, scripture out of a Holy Name Bible. Containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by A.B. Trena of the Scripture Research Association. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath brought us for the self same thing is Elohim, who also hath given unto us the pledge of the Spirit. Wherefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from Yahweh. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yahweh. Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted by him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of Yahweh, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto Yahweh, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For if we be beside ourselves, it is to Elohim, and if we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of the Messiah constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, 
Yea, though we have known the Messiah after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in the Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of Yahweh, who hath reconciled us to himself by Yahshua the Messiah, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that Yahweh was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for the Messiah, as though Elohim did beseech you by us. We pray you in the Messiah's stead, be ye reconciled to Yahweh. For, for he hath made him to be sin offering for us. We knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. Thank you, Dr. Josephson. Um, I'd like to welcome all returning visitors. We will be having three speakers or more this evening. First speaker will be from our Green Bay branch, Dr. Jeff Johnson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's interesting how this class has different effects on different folks. Um, having been down here for quite a while now, <clears throat> I remember very well walking in the door for the first time and hearing these basic things taught that these names on the screen here, they're important, that I'm not calling them important because I said so. I'm calling them important because Yahweh said so. Yahweh used his own name over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. <clears throat> it's just profound, the power that is in the name Yahweh and hence Yahshua, that he will be salvation. He who is self-existing, he who causes all things to exist, he who causes breath, he who causes everything will also be your salvation. It's quite profound that it's not about knowing how to spell the name. It's not about knowing how to pronounce the name. It's not about knowing Hebrew history. It's not about knowing anything about grammar or proper spelling or, you know, nothing, nothing uh, academic. You know, you can look these names up in your encyclopedias and your dictionaries and your concordances. They all point to those four letters right over Yahweh's name, those, di those Hebrew characters right over Yahweh's name, known as the Tetragrammaton. There is no doubt that the name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. There is no doubt that Yahweh himself came and manifested in the flesh as Yahshua the Messiah. <clears throat> the world will have an excuse for everything you try and tell them that abides according to facts and evidence. It's not important. It doesn't matter. He knows who you're talking to. I prefer Jehovah or I prefer Lord God and Jesus Christ. Those are traditions of my family. Those are, you know, the, the excuses are endless in the list. Nobody wants to abide by what doth saith Yahweh. And Yahweh himself said his name was important. Go over and get for me Exodus, the ninth chapter and the 16th verse. Let's start there tonight. <coughs> Do I have a reader? Yep, I'm here, and um, I think Greg is the other reader. Okay, He's Exodus there. 9 and 16, please. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So he raised up Pharaoh down in the land of Egypt as the most powerful, powerful ruler that the earth knew at that time. And he put the children of Israel down there in subjection, in slavery to that ruler, to that Pharaoh. 
he sent Moses to him with the name from the burning bush and said, come now, therefore, and go unto Pharaoh and deliver my children that they may worship me. So you're in a situation where all of the circumstances are set up by Yahweh himself. He put the children of Israel down there. He raised Pharaoh up according to dreams that were given to Joseph that gave him the inside baseball on saving up crops for an upcoming famine. The whole world and the whole area went into a massive famine for seven years, had no food, had to go to Egypt, and had to submit unto Pharaoh in order to sustain themselves, in order to live. Children of Israel ended up in bondage down there, exactly as Yahweh had told Abraham before in Canaan's land that he would put his seed into a land that they knew not of and be evilly entreated. So he set up the whole circumstances. And, and read that again, if you would, Gail, the Exodus 9, 16. And the very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So this was a declaration of his name. His name was not known even unto the children of Israel before that burning bush with Moses in Exodus, the third chapter. So there was a long period of history from the Garden of Eden all the way down through the flood and then on down to the children of Israel at that burning bush where they had never known anything other than El Shaddai, which was Almighty Provider or Elohim with us. They never, they never knew anything more about their provider, uh, about their creator concerning a name until now, until this point in time, everything was set up for this very cause to declare his name to the whole world. And now you've got mankind for 3,500 years since that transpired and that salvation was shown unto the entire world and he defeated Pharaoh and his host and delivered the children up into the land of uh, the wilderness of Sinai there, and later on into Canaan's land and gave them the inheritance that was promised to Abraham. So 400 and almost 500 years total round trip, he made known unto the world who he was and how important his name was. If you're here for your first time or your hundredth time, it shouldn't matter to you that you've heard this before. It should be the most important thing to you is his name. It's what will give you salvation. His name will cause salvation. It will cause liberty. It will free you from the ignorance of this world. That black portion of that screen down there, that chart down at the bottom there, that Egypt is black, meaning dark earth or you know black. But it, it is more important to realize that that was the ignorance of the world. They were polytheistic, many gods, just like our world is today. There's Allah and Buddha and, and thousands and thousands of gods worshipped on this earth plane today, just like there was down there in that land of Egypt. And they all had a name. Now, Yahweh has a name that's above every name. And he made it so. He's the creator of everything. Let's go over to Acts, the 17th chapter, and start at 24. Okay, Acts 17 and 24. Yep. And if you would pick it up just a, a couple of verses there, verse 22. Sure. Acts 7, 20, 17, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. Okay, I'll stop you right there, Greg. Just to set this up. Now, Paul was the apostle that was brought in after the death, burial, and, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. Judas was hung and, and was found to be corrupted. You know, the way he was set was, uh, it's another whole lecture, but there was 11 out of 12 remaining after Judas did what he did. And Paul was the one that Yahshua ordained to come in as an apostle and replace him so that the 12 were restored. But he's standing in Mars Hill in Greece and in Athens, and they have a, a idol or a devotion unto every known God that there is. And Paul comes across one that says to the unknown, and he's going to talk about this one. So they're so superstitious, they, they don't want to leave any God out. Okay, so go ahead, Greg, start there again at 22. Yes. 
Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Okay, so they're worried about any God that they forget coming down on them and raining terror on them. We talked about the terror of Yahweh in the scripture reading tonight, and it was shown back there with that Pharaoh and his host that he has the power to take down entire nations at one fell swoop, okay, and desolate them. His power was shown that day. Go ahead, Greg. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Yep. So it's an unknown God. They, they're trying to cover all the bases. Keep going. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Okay, so we've got a declaration again, just like there was back there in Exodus with those children of Israel and Pharaoh, that he is being declared. And at this time, he is unknown to them. They don't even have an inscription with the name Yahweh on it. They've just got one to the unknown in case they missed one. And in very deed, they have missed him. They've missed the time of their visitation. They missed him in the flesh multiple times. That's another lecture all unto itself. But keep going, please. Elohim that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is the ruler of heaven and earth. Okay, he's the ruler of everything. We're not leaving anything out. Heaven and earth. The whole universe is his. Keep going dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Okay, so we need to stop here and explain this a little bit because right away, this may go against everything you've ever known in your life concerning religion or a god or worship or anything else. He dwells not in temples made in hands. So this unknown god, this Yahweh that they know not, that they ignorantly worship, he's being declared unto them and unto you that he is not dwelling in temples made with hands, okay? Yahweh gave instructions for three things to be built. They're all on the chart here. You've got Noah's Ark down there before the flood came. That was salvation unto his family. You have the tabernacle in the wilderness. Moses was given a vision up on top of the mount of how to build it, see that everything is built according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. And then the third thing was Solomon's temple later on after the children of Israel were migrated up into Canaan's land. So all of them were threefold in structure, all of them according to the pattern that was given to Moses and divinely instructed, inspired, and Yahweh even put his spirit in mankind to accomplish the building of those three things. He has never since instructed anyone to build a church, to build a mosque to build a synagogue, to build any type of building of worship. It's just fallacy. It's people with dreams saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. And they peep and mutter, and they, they just go about to set up their own righteousness. It is not from Yahweh. Keep reading where you are, Greg. Verse 25 now. Neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath in all things. Okay, so that life, breath, and all things, he needs nothing from you. He gave everything to all. So his name means he who causes to exist, he who causes breath. He gives everything to us freely. He is not worshiped with your hands. He does not need you to put your hands together when you pray. He does not need you building things for him. He does not need your money. He doesn't need any of that. He gives you all things. If this is a, a whole role reversal from anything you might have learned in the world prior to coming into this class. This is what doth saith Yahweh. He is saying, I don't need this. This is Paul commissioned by Yahshua to teach the Gentiles and he is going to the Gentiles and preaching this to them under the inspiration of Yahweh from the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, not Paul's opinion. This is what doth saith Yahweh. Keep reading. 
and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face, excuse me, for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So he's got it figured out ahead of time. He's determined the times, the limits and bounds of our habitation. How long we're going to be on this earth plane, every one of us, is determined ahead of time. It's all thought out in the realm of eternity before he comes in and makes a creation so that it can go according to plan. Keep reading, please. That they should seek Yahweh, if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Okay, so if you've been around for a Names and Tabernacle lecture, you should understand the basic premise that the tabernacle was a place for Yahweh to dwell amongst his people. And we compare that directly to the human body. If you want to go ahead and click on that chart, Roxy. We compare one-to-one one one across the board there how that tabernacle is a direct representation of your body. You are made in the image of Elohim by the pattern of the tabernacle. It was the pattern shown to Moses 3,500 years ago in the mountain, and now is manifest why that was so important. It's the pattern of everything. Right down to the atoms and cells, the whole thing goes according to his purpose, according to his plan, his pattern. None of it is left a chance. Um, yep, you can go ahead and click on the green chart there if you would. 15, I think, is the green chart. Um, the atoms and the cells are right there side by side, that threefold structure. You got a proton and a neutron, just like the holy place and most holy place. Then you've got the court roundabout compared to the electron going all the way around. You've got the nucleus and nucleolus in the cell surrounded by a cell body. There's, there's just no way to escape this pattern. You are not your own. You are Yahweh's. He has made you. He holds the key to everything, and it is this pattern. This is the key to you understanding the importance of Yahweh and his purpose, that he is real, that he does exist, and that he has purpose for everything in his creation. We're, we're talking about a creator that leaves nothing to chance, everything thought about ahead of time, everything planned out and coming true according to what he declared. Keep reading one more verse there, please. The 28th verse, <laughs> for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. So we abide right within the cloud. Yahweh in pure spirit, you see it up there on the top left, is the cloud. And that's the symbol he used to describe himself, even though he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the limits, bounds, source, and substance of everything. And you can't get outside of Yahweh to look back at him and see what he looks like. We're talking about an invisible spirit that he dwells in eternity. He fills heaven and earth with his spirit. The whole thing abides right within him. So you're talking about a universe that's almost unimaginable for size. You're talking about a solar system that can't be crossed in a lifetime. You're talking about stars. You're talking about multiple galaxies, trillions of galaxies. Like there's trillions of cells in your body. It's all macro and micro, all right within the cloud. In him, you live, move, and have your being. Not outside of Yahweh. Nothing is co-eternal with Yahweh. Nothing is outside the cloud. Everything abides within the cloud. He is your source and your substance, your limits and bounds. Um, from there, let's jump over to... Uh, Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 and read that, please. You might have to pick it up a couple of verses just to catch the context, but just want to remind, you know, anyone in this class that um, right at 6 and 19 is good. Go ahead and, and read that if you would, please. 1 Corinthians. Okay. 
what? Knowing not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of Yahweh, and you are not your own. And then 20 as well. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify Yahweh in your body and in your spirit, which are Yahweh's. Okay, so we're not leaving anything out here. There's nothing that you can hold back from Yahweh. There's not a thought in your head that Yahweh can't see. Um, let's also go over and get Hebrews 4 and 12, please. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the biting asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and moral, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And then one more verse there, please. Yep, okay. keep going. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Okay. We're talking about a creator again that just does not, there's no hiding spot. Let's jump over to Jeremiah 23 and 23, please. I'm going to take the time to just grab a few of these scriptures so that you can see that Yahweh is the one telling you this is how he is. Not my words, these are his words. Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I an Elohim at hand, saith Yahweh, and not an Elohim afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I should shall not see him, saith Yahweh? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith Yahweh? Okay, so we've got a creator that's an Elohim at hand. He's not afar off. He's not up above sun, moon, and stars. He's dwelling right in his people now, here in the earth plane. He has created you for a purpose to come here and hear this gospel preached with witnesses, to hear what he has to say, and for it to have an effect on you. Now, it's not necessarily going to have an effect that any of us know which direction it's going to go. If you could go over and get the mysteries chart for me a second. There's a vision given at the top of this chart here. And a vision given unto all people, regardless of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. We're not talking about a vision that is discriminatory. We're talking about a vision to all. Every language, every country, every race, every age, indiscriminate. The same vision in this earth plane given to everyone. But what that vision does is it is either given unto them as a delusion, which means despite the facts, or it's given unto them as a revelation, which is unto life. Now, the delusion is unto death. The ignorance itself is nothing that will kill you. The ignorance is not sin. The ignorance clouds and covers your vision so that you can't see him, so that you can't see him as he really is and actually exists. You're in the dark. The light's not on. And left in the dark, you're left to your vices, and you will utterly corrupt yourselves. That's how the children of Israel were told what would happen unto them is they would be utterly corrupted by that mystery of iniquity, that, that delusion, that ignorance, the ways of the world. It's iniquity. It's all iniquity to Yahweh. It's all sinful. It's all, it's, it's just a lack of light. It's a lack of understanding. It's a lack of knowledge. Go over and get John 17 and three for me. John 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Elohim, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. So your only hope is to know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists and what his purpose is. And his purpose is that he will be salvation. That's what the name Yahshua means. He will be your salvation. He will cause liberation. He will turn on the lights for you. 
so that you can understand, so that you can start to begin to see him as he is and exists. You don't have a spirit detector. You need to be shown. You need to, you need to have somebody point things out for you and make things obvious. You need someone with the Holy Spirit to speak unto you so that you can have an opportunity to learn. Without learning, there is no knowledge. So if you know the world continues to learn and just continues to do these same traditions and continues to do these same things in a, in a darkened state with no understanding and no revelation of truth, they're doomed. It's up to him who he's going to show. Let's go over and get Matthew 11 and 27, please. Read down through the end of that chapter and I'll have my seat. Matthew 11 and 27. This is Yahshua speaking. Okay. All things are delivered unto me of my father. And no man knoweth the son, but the father. Neither knoweth any man the father, save the son. And he, to whomsoever the son will reveal him. So it's up to Yahshua to show you that he is real, that he does exist, and that he is the one causing your salvation and turning on the lights for you. It's not up to a man. It's not up to me. It's not up to our dean. It's not up to anybody in this school. It's our duty to show you what we've been shown with witnesses and let the chips fall where they may. Keep going if you would, Gail. 28. Come on to me, all you that labor and are heaven, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This world will wear you out. This world will absolutely bring you to your knees and, and cause a lot of pain and strife and suffering. So this is the one place in the world where we're all even. There's no big eyes and little U's. We all come here to learn. We all come here to be shown. And just come in and listen and pay attention, and it will pay you huge dividends. Keep going. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This, this class is not an easy place to be for anyone that's been, you know, confused by the world. Um, the truth can definitely be painful, but there is so much righteousness, peace, and joy to be had that it's just absolutely imperative that you come and let your soul rest and be filled and have some soul food, things that are good for you to eat, things that are good for you to chew on and, and think about. And, and, you know, the only true peace is that your mind is stayed on Yahshua. So unless you are called and he gives you that food and gives you that rest, there's not much we can do other than just continue to preach and continue to show people what we've been shown. Um, let's go over to John 14 and 26, and then I will be down. John 14 and verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So again, it's up to Yahshua to do the work and, and show the increase. And the Father draws those to him that will hear this. So we hope that you'll come back and you'll continue to give us opportunity to show you what we know. And continue to study with us because this is for all of our learning and for all of our edification and building up. So with that, I will hand it back to the moderator. All peace and love in Yashua. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. And our next speaker will be from our Madison, Wisconsin branch, Dr. Sasha Rachmalevich. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me well? Can hear you okay. Great. It's uh, it's good to be here and to share uh, the good news of Yahshua the Messiah. 
I really enjoyed what the first speaker was talking about. It was very uh, simple and easy to follow. And it was very profound talking about the purpose of Yahweh. So I know that, uh, and I appreciate that there are returning visitors on the Zoom class. So I'll try to talk uh, about the purpose of Yahweh, because that's all we're talking about in this class is whoever is on the floor talking about um, different aspects of the same purpose of uh, Yahweh. And what is uh, the purpose of Yahweh? So the purpose of Yahweh is um, the first speaker was already saying uh, is in the name of uh, the savior. It's in the name of Yasha, which means Yahweh is salvation. So this is uh, uh, the purpose. And that's who Yahshua is. He is not the uh, third person of the Trinity as the Christianity teaches, but it's Yahweh uh, himself in, uh, who came into the physical body to save the people. Now, the question is what uh, Yahshua or our creator who is Yahshua, what is he saving people from? So let's um, go to Matthew chapter one and uh, verse 21, please. Matthew one and 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Thank you. So this is a angel is given a prophecy about the birth of the Messiah. And uh, I know that it's, uh, it says Jesus in the King James Bible, but it was no letter J uh, at that time, or even now in Hebrew language. So he couldn't say Jesus because his true name is Yahshua. And name Jesus doesn't mean savior. It doesn't uh, have father's name in it. So a name Yahshua has both. It has Yah, you see on this chart, it has uh, the father's part of the name Yah. And uh, Shua in, uh, in conjunction with Yah means uh, salvation. So name Yah of Yahshua means Yahweh's salvation. So the prophecy is given that, um, you know, the uh, child will be born and his name will be Yahshua because he will save his people from their sins. So that's what Yahshua is uh, uh, saving people from. Now, uh, I want to go uh, to the scripture reading now, which is 2 Corinthians 5th chapter. And uh, start reading from verse 18, please. Second Corinthians 5, 18. Second yeah. Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of Yahweh, who hath reconciled us to himself by Yahshua and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Continue on, to, please. Mm -hmm. To wit that Yahweh was in Yahshua reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Yahshua as though Yahweh did beseech you by us, we pray you in Yahshua's stead, be ye reconciled to Yahweh. So we read in several verses that we need to be reconciled to Yahweh. And uh, how we can be reconciled uh, to Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah. But we need to understand why we need to be uh, reconciled to Yahweh. The, uh, verse 21, please. 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. 
Thank you. So there is a lot of uh, in these uh, verses, and I'll try to uh, address it, address this as uh, uh, time allows, really briefly. But it's a very important uh, uh, subject of, and it's a very important part of the purpose of Yahweh. It's uh, saving His people from their sins or being reconciled to the Father. So let the, uh, and uh, in the uh, religion, in the Christian religion in particular, this, uh, um, you know, the understanding of this uh, uh, important subject is, uh, uh, is not uh, correct, which I will uh, try to show you as well. So may I share the screen, please? Yes. Okay, um, let, let me see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, uh, please let me see if, uh, let me know if you can see uh, it's there. this uh, chart. Okay, great. So here is this picture. So on the left side, there is a man. On the right side is Yahweh. And there is separation between Yahweh and man. This is sin. We have to understand what the sin is. We can understand why it's a problem. And we really have to understand what Yahshua has done. Because what he has done, as far as us being reconciled to the Father, it's not really taught in the religious world. And by the way, while I am uh, showing the slides, when my time is uh, getting close, like five minutes, please let me know because I cannot see the screen. Yep, I'll let uh, you know. Thank you, Sasha. Great, thank you. So why knowing about sin is important? Uh, in Ezekiel, 18 and 20, we read, the soul that sins, it shall die. So it's really a, the matter of life uh, and death. And nobody of us uh, wants to die. And by the way, it's, it's talking about not physical death, but it's talking about spiritual death. It's talking, as we read here, about the death of the soul. Now, can somebody read for me from the screen? It's 1 Corinthians 15 from 1 to 4. So this is the gospel. The gospel is the good news. Yep. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that the Messiah died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So th thank you. So this is kind of the definition of the gospel, according to Apostle Paul. And there are several things uh, in there. One of them that this gospel is uh, it saves us when we keep it in memory the second one this gospel is according to the witnesses in the scriptures and the scriptures are the old testament of the bible and we take time in this class uh, going through the examples in the law and the prophets or the old testament scriptures to show death burial and resurrection of yashua the messiah but there is also Another aspect of it, as you see uh, in red color, that he died for our sins. And that's kind of what I would like to address in uh, this uh, talk. So what is sin? First of all, you know, the first speaker said that ignorance uh, is not sin, which is correct. But we have to understand what the sin is because people have different uh, definitions of the sin. According to, this, uh, to the Bible, as we read in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, 
it says, whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, and we'll go back to what, uh, what sin is and what law we are talking about. So what was the first sin? The first sin which separated Yahweh with man. So if you look at this uh, chart, you can see it on the first, um, in the first story, uh, in this uh, depicted in the chart, as we all know this uh, story, it's transgression uh, in the garden when Eve was deceived by the serpent who was Satan and ate the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam and Adam ate it with her. And that's uh, how the sin came into the world. Why it was sin? Because it was transgression of the law. The law or commandment was given to Adam, you shall not eat the fruit uh, of the tree of good and evil. And uh, Adam disobeyed and therefore it was sin. Um, let me see. So, um, I don't, well, before going there, could you please uh, read in uh, 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 Romans chapter 5, verse, uh, starting 12. from verse 12? Thank you. Yeah, Romans 5, verse 12. Uh, well, let me see. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just. Uh, okay. Wherefore, mm -hmm. wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Thank you. So we read that the sin entered into the world with uh, Adam and uh, sin reigned, reigned in the world from uh, uh, Adam uh, to uh, Moses, including you know, the time of the uh, old uh, covenant. So does it uh, mean that we are under this law of Adam because sin came with Adam and uh, now we are under this um, curse of Adam or so-called original sin that what Catholic uh, called, you know, this uh, particular sin. The Catholic categorized sins based on their gravity. It's original sin, mortal sin, and venial sins are three classes of sins. But the Catholics, as well as Protestants, they both teach that people now, uh, in our time, are still under original sin or under the uh, sin of Adam. And we read it already, that's where I put it, in Romans fifth uh, chapter. Now, oops, let me see. But uh, let's, we finished reading at verse 14 in Romans uh, fifth chapter. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come. But in verse 15, we read, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of Yahweh and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Yahshua the Messiah, has abounded unto many. So it says here that, uh, with Adam came death, but with Yahshua the Messiah came life. So how, uh, how is it happening? Please read in uh, John 1, 29. 
So this is uh, John the Baptist. Well, maybe I'll, I'll read it for the sake of time. Uh, uh, when uh, the jo uh, John the Baptist is seeing uh, Yasha at his baptism, he is making the statement. Um, the next day, John sees Yasha coming unto him and says, behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, which takes away the sin of the world. Now notice that sin is in a singular form. It's not plural. So what is the sin of the world? Sin of the world is this uh, sin of Adam. So let's give you the witness, the proof from the Bible that uh, this Adamic sin was atoned for by Yahshua the Messiah and taken away. So we're not under the sin of Adam. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, 20, verse 5, we read, uh, that's where the Ten Commandments are given. I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So it means the children are suffering from the sins of, uh, 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 of the fathers. Now, before I go there, so why it's um, uh, under the third and the fourth generation? Because fourth generation would be allegorically, it's like 4,000 years. And we know that Yahshua the Messiah came in the end of the 4,000 years. So after the Messiah came, so it's not going to be uh, continued to the fifth generation, the sixth generation, so to speak, because this uh, sin is atoned for. And that's um, the witness. So in Jeremiah 31 verses 29 and 30, and this chapter of Jeremiah, we usually read from Jeremiah 31, 31, but this is a prophecy about the new covenant. And we read, in those days, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eats the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. So at the new covenant or after death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, because the new covenant comes on the day of Pentecost at AD 33, then everybody is responsible for his or her own sins, but not for the sin of uh, Adam, because he came to take away the sin of the world. And we read in Matthew already that he shall save his people from their sins. So going back to this question, what law are we under? People think that we are under the law of Moses, especially we are under the Ten Commandment law. So are we under the Ten Commandments? Now, to remind you, and this is, we cannot even give this lecture in two hours about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So you have to uh, come back and learn about it. But this uh, Ten Commandment law, together with the uh, 603 more laws and ordinances, in total 613 laws were given after the children of Israel came out of Egypt around 1490 BC uh, or before the birth of Yahshua. And uh, Moses uh, came on the top of um, Mount Sinai and he was given this uh, 10 commandments law and other ordinances of old covenant. Uh, suffice it to say the, uh, for this uh, lecture, for, because I don't have much time, that these laws and ordinances, there were only uh, physical, there were physical laws given to the physical people and not only to the physical people, they were not given to uh, people in Green Bay or people in Russia and people in China or people in Italy, they were given to Israelites, to Israel and Israel 
only when you read, uh, you know, how the 10 commandments were given. So they were not given to uh, Gentiles. Nevertheless, Christians who are Gentiles for the most part think that they are under this law, not understanding why this law was given. So the mission of Yahshua the Messiah, because he knew and the scripture is saying that nobody was able to keep this Old uh, Testament laws. So he came to fulfill this uh, law, as it says in the scripture in Colossians 2.14, he nailed it to the cross and will go back uh, to this law. So uh, talk about this law uh, a little bit later on. So we read in Romans uh, chapter eight, verse two, for the law of spirit of life in Yahshua the Messiah has made me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of the spirit of life in Yahshua the Messiah? This is the law of the spirit or the law of the new covenant. When people who believe the true gospel receives Holy Spirit, which started on the day of Pentecost and continues until now and will continue until the true gospel is preached and before the universal revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. So this law of the spirit has made me, Paul is talking about himself, has made me free from the law of sin and death. And what's the law of sin and death? It's the Old uh, uh, Testament, Old Covenant law. If you sin, you die. That's kind of what this law was. So this law was fulfilled by Yahshua the Messiah. And uh, it's not, you know, we are not under this law. Uh, so we are, we are under the law of spirit of life in Yahshua the Messiah. And those people who receive uh, the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if you, the Holy Spirit is in you and me or in people, these people cannot break this law because this law is inside of you and it uh, uh, governs your conscience. If time allows, I will uh, go into it in more detail. So the question is what law people are under when they don't believe in Yahshua the Messiah. And there are majority of the people in the world, they either don't believe in any God, they're atheist, or they believe some kind of uh, gods in different religions. And even in Christianity, they don't believe in the true gospel of uh, Yahshua the Messiah. They believe in their own uh, uh, the gods of their denominations, so gods of their uh, traditions. So what law people are under when they don't believe in Yahshua? In Romans chapter three, verse 23, it says, for all have sinned. I mean, all it means Jews and Gentiles, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of Yahweh. So what the law uh, people are under in general? So in Romans two, verses 14 and 15, we see the answer to this question. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by, do by the nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience all be, also bear witness, and their thoughts uh, they mean while accusing or else excusing one another. So this is the law of the conscience, which is given to everyone, you know, to every person when the person is born. And it's a law of conscience. So what is conscience from Miriam Webster dictionary? It's the sense of consciousness of the moral goodness or blameworthiness of one's own conduct, intentions, or character, together with the feeling of obligation to do right or to be good. 
as we read in John chapter 1 and 9, uh, talking about uh, Yahweh Elohim, it says, uh, that was the true light which lightens every man that comes into the world. So in other words, everyone um, is born with the law of conscience, or people also call it a, a small, a small uh, quiet voice uh, within ourselves. Because we know uh, without any law what's good, what's not. In the Bible, for example, before the Mosaic law or Old Covenant was given, we read the stories about Abraham and uh, his wife and the Pharaoh wanted to take and sleep uh, with the wife of Abraham, thinking that she is his sister. But it was uh, revealed to him that it's not good. And his conscience told him that it would be a wrong thing for him to do because uh, he learned that uh, she was the wife of um, uh, uh, Abraham. And uh, it wasn't law, outward law given you shall not commit adultery, but inside of him, this law uh, was uh, present. So in the uh, pictorial illustration, that's why I like um, PowerPoint because you can uh, present, you can explain uh, things better using some uh, kind of visual aids. So there is a conscience within our mind, you can call it within our heart and our mind. And what this conscience is um, uh, controlled by, so when the people are growing in the world, you know, the satanic spirit uh, comes uh, into the people's mind. Therefore, we read in the so-called New Testament how Yahshua the Messiah was casting out satanic spirits out of man. But it didn't change because satanic spirits are abound uh, and uh, they uh, uh, entered into the uh, people's mind, either one or several, and they govern the conscience of the people. And the people's conscience uh, become, uh, becomes defiled. As we read in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. This is the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in 1 Timothy 4 and 2, we read, now the spirit speaks expressively that in the later times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot iron. And uh, in Acts 17 chapter, which we already uh, read, uh, the first speaker read it, it says, that Yahweh made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Why he did it? That they should seek Yahweh. However, we read in Psalms 14 and 2 and 3 that Yahweh looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek Elohim. They all gone aside. They all together became filthy. There is none that does good. Not, not one. Actually, no one was uh, seeking uh, Yahweh as well. What did Mosaic law uh, did with this situation when people have satanic spirit with the evil conscience? Apostle Paul is saying, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God, uh, Yahweh forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law has said, thou shall not covet. So the law made sin exceedingly sinful. It pointed out the law. Actually, in the Bible, in uh, if you check it later in 2 Corinthians 3 and 7, it's talking about 10 commandments law as ministration of death. People want to keep 10 commandments because they think it brings life. It's 180 degrees opposite from the truth. It was given to make sin exceedingly uh, sinful. 
And it says in Hebrews 9 and 9 that this old uh, covenant couldn't make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Uh, I don't have uh, time, but in Romans 7 chapter, Apostle Paul is uh, talking about his state and condition uh, before he received the Holy Spirit. He's saying, for the good which I would, I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Now, I should say that in Christianity, they take this uh, chapter of Romans, what Paul is saying, and say, look, Paul, he is the apostle. He has the Holy Spirit. And you see how he divided? It means he has the spiritual nature and uh, sinful nature in uh, fighting one which uh, another within Paul. This is, again, 180 degrees opposite from uh, the truth because they don't understand that's what uh, Paul describing here. He is describing his state and condition before the Holy Spirit came or under the old uh, covenant. But, uh, and uh, in Romans uh, 8 chapter, it says, uh, there is therefore now, now when, when the Holy Spirit came, I, it should say Romans uh, 7, uh, 24, and then Romans 8, 1 and 2. So when the Holy Spirit came, and that's what Paul describes in eighth chapter of Romans as the contrast. Now, therefore, now is no condemnation to them which are in Yahshua, the Messiah, who walk after the flesh, and not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Yahshua, the Messiah, has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the Holy Spirit, or Yahshua, the Messiah, freed Paul from this uh, you know, condemned state of mind, from this fight within. And it happened to Paul, and it can happen with you and me if we uh, believe and accept true gospel of Yahshua, uh, the Messiah. And Yahshua is casting down the satanic spirits, as it says in Revelations uh, 12 chapter. I just don't, I'm looking at the clock and I don't, uh, uh, have time to go there because I would like to uh, make uh, some points. But actually, uh, we read here that there was a war in heaven of Michael and his angels against Satan and his angels. And in the end, um, the chapter, so the Satan and his angels were cast uh, down. And uh, I read from nine and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our Elohim and the power of his Messiah for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our Elohim day and night. So how they overcame him, verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, which is the gospel of Yahshua, the Messiah, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So whatever was happening in this heaven, which is described there, it's also happening in people's heaven or in people's mind because when the true gospel is being preached to them who never heard it before, then the war is happening. The war of the satanic spirit, which governs the conscience and the Holy Spirit, which is trying to cast out the satanic spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit overcomes you know, the satanic spirit or cast it out by the blood of the lamb, you know, by the preaching of the gospel. Now, this is the last part of what I want to talk about. Hopefully, I have uh, uh, some time. You what have, did... Sasha, you have six minutes, so go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. 
So what did Yasha accomplish by his uh, death? First, uh, uh, but Yahweh commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, the Messiah died for us first. And uh, I'll be uh, quick. Uh, I'm just quoting you the scriptures probably without reading it because I don't have much time or reading all of them. First, he took upon himself a penalty of sin because if you sin, the soul which sin, uh, we read it, shall die. So therefore, Yahshua came and took upon himself, being innocent, took the sins of the people, your and mine upon himself, and took the penalty of the sin, so we would not die. That's what he accomplished. As it says in Isaiah 53 and 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We read it in Romans 6, uh, 23 as well. What also he did, he forgave our sins. Uh, Matthew 6, 14, 15, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men this trespasses, neither will your father forgive you, your trespasses. Now, Yahshua is saying it under this old covenant. So it sounds that you have to forgive the person first and then Yahweh, you know, forgive you. Not under this um, uh, new covenant. I'll just skip uh, Jeremiah 31, 34. You can read it when you have time. But under the new covenant, Ephesians 6 and 32, it's all by grace. And be you kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as Yahweh for the Messiah's sake has forgiven you. Not that you have to forgive somebody first and then Yahweh forgive you. No, the new covenant is the covenant of grace. He forgives you and therefore he empowers you and me to forgive our transpassers. Uh, the same we read in uh, Colossians 2 and 13. What also uh, Yahshua did, he cleansed our conscience. This is satanic spirit, uh, govern our conscience and people are sin centered. But then the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit uh, uh, cast out the satanic spirit and Holy Spirit governs our conscience and we become not sin centered, but son centered. It's a big difference. And there are scriptures about uh, that. Uh, let's say Hebrews 10 and 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. For by one offering, he, Yahshua, has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 14. And what's another very important, and then I'm finishing, uh, aspect what Yahshua accomplished by his death, he removed sin. He took away sin. This is contrary to what Roman Catholics and Protestants teach. They teach that as long as you are in a physical body, even if you are a Christian, you continue to sin. And that's uh, undermine the sacrifice of Yahshua the Messiah and what he has accomplished. We read in the Psalms 103, verses from 10 and 12. He has not dealt with us after our sins, not rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has he removed our transgressions from us. And I'll finish probably with the scripture reading. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he has made him, Yahshua, to be seen for us who knew no sin, that we might be, might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. So 
just in a quick example, when in Old Testament, they were bringing sacrifices like the lamb sacrifice, sacrifice for sin. It was the type of Yahshua, the Messiah, all sacrifices pointing out to him. But people, but uh, the, um, uh, the sinful person would lay his hands on the sacrifice and therefore transfer, you know, the sins on the uh, 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 allegorically transfer the sins on this innocent animal, innocent lamb. But also this transfer goes both ways because the righteousness or innocence of the lamb is being transferred to the guilty person. And that's what Yahshua has done for us. He took upon himself a penalty of the sin for us, forgave our sins, cleansed our conscience, removed sin. And what he requires of us, just believe, just believe that he did it and not believe, have a blind belief, but come to class and uh, check, uh, hear the witnesses and check them out. So with that, thank you for your attention and all praise and glory be to Yahshua, through Yahshua, uh, to, uh, to Yahshua, the Messiah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. And our, our last speaker this evening will be the Dean from Lansing, Michigan, Dr. Terry Welsh. Oh, good evening, good evening. I uh, am happy to be here with you and uh, surprised to uh, be called. I am also very uh, impressed and pleased with what I just heard. Um, it's quite interesting to me uh, that Sasha covered sin so efficiently there. Um, I actually uh, had been asked questions about sin and <clears throat> here, and uh, uh, I have outlined and put a number of scriptures together, and I uh, went through a fair amount of that information, almost identical to what Sasha covered, um, with a few more scriptures in there, but, uh, and I did this on, let me see, uh, the, the fourth of this month, the ninth and the twelfth. Um, so I took, uh, well, on the fourth, it was the last part of the class, but on the ninth and the twelfth, um, it was actually the entire class session, and um, we weren't wasting a lot of words, and it was very, I'm very impressed, Sasha. <laughs> He's very good and able to get that much done in that short a period of time that efficiently. And I, I really, really sincerely appreciate that. Um, one of the things that uh, should be, I think, addressed about sin is that there is uh, sin that is forgivable and sin that is not forgivable. That was the, that way under the Old Testament. It is that way uh, now. And it's important to understand what it is. So if you go to the Old Testament, which shows the um, foundation, the roof, heights and shadows, from which the principles are drawn, uh, we could get Leviticus, the fourth chapter, and if you wouldn't mind, please get the fourth chapter of Leviticus, the fourth verse, 13th verse, 27th verse. Leviticus 4 and 4. And he shall bring the bullock onto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Yahweh, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before Yahweh. 13. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of Yahweh concerning things, 
which should not be done and are guilty. And then okay. 20. Yeah, and, and well, go to the 27th verse and then we'll back up a little bit, please. Okay, 27. And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he does somewhat against any of the commandments of Yahweh concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what he's referring to there is what has to happen with whether it's a priest, a uh, ruler or a common person in Israel if they sinned through ignorance. And that is the key word right there, sinned through ignorance. Okay? Um, and I think we might pick up another one, I think, in the fifth chapter, maybe the 15th verse. Leviticus 5.15. Mm-hmm. If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of Yahweh, then he shall bring for his trespass unto Yahweh a ram without blemish mm -hmm. out of the flocks with thy estimation by shekels of silver after mm -hmm. the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. Okay. So again, uh, it refers to sin through ignorance and it shows that there can be forgiveness for that. There has to be atonement made. Um, and uh, there's a procedure for the atonement. And as Sasha pointed out, Yahshua is actually the one that made atonement for all mankind. He, uh, it, the scripture, I think it's in First Timothy, says that Yahshua is the savior of all men, especially of them that believe. And he saved all men from sin just like he said, the sin of Adam, which was uh, upon all men, the death that passed upon all men, and then also the Israel uh, with the Old Testament. And uh, however here, these sins that can be forgiven are sins through ignorance, and then there is sin that cannot be forgiven. It's ir irreconcilable. It's called in the Old Testament presumptuous sin. Now the word presumptuous is sometimes confused with the word assumption. In other words, they, a lot of times people confuse the idea that someone would assume something to be with the word presumption or presumptuous. And they don't mean the same thing for the sake of time. I'm not going to have it looked up. And you can always, you know, go ahead and, and look up these words. But presumptuous sin is sin that is rebellious. It's high-handed. It's defiant of Yahweh and his right to rule. And um, I think we can look at some scriptures that relate with that and the contrast because between that and sin that can be forgiven uh, that you just read about, that was sin through ignorance. Uh, go to Numbers 15, verse 27 through 31, please. Numbers 15, verse 27. And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year for a sin offering. Mm -hmm. And the priest shall make an atonement for the soul that sinneth ignorantly. Yep. When he sinneth by ignorance before Yahweh to make mm -hmm. an atonement for him, mm -hmm. and it shall be forgiven him. Mm-hmm. Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. Mm -hmm. But the soul that doth ought presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reapproacheth Yahweh. The same reproacheth Yahweh, correct? Is that what it says? Yes. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. 
and that Saul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of Yahweh, and hath broken his commandment, that soul shall utterly be cut off, his, ig or his iniquity shall be upon him. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Verse that's, that's, is that 30? All right, go through 31, please. Uh, that was that was through 31. Oh, okay, that's good. Thank you. So anyway, yeah. you can see the difference there. Sin that's done through ignorance is forgivable. Sin that is done presumptuously because it reproaches Yahweh. It defies Yahweh's law and his right to rule. Um, that is basically what's happened is that the person that does that not only rejects Yahweh's right to condemn, but he also in the process rejects Yahweh's right to forgive. Because if Yahweh doesn't have the right to condemn, he doesn't have the right to forgive. And so, uh, you, you know, they've rejected everything there and that soul shall be cut off and that ends up meaning dying. Now, I think there's a, uh, why don't you go to 1 John? This is obviously not under the Old Testament, but the same principle applies. I think it's 1 John 5, maybe about verse 16 through 18, something like that. First John 5, 15. Mm -hmm. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I I do not say that he shall pray for, for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Mm -hmm. So, we, oh, I'm sorry, which verse are you at now? Um, I was just going to read 18. I, please, I forgot please do. Okay. Please do. 18. We know that whosoever is born of Yahweh sins not. Right. But he that is begotten of Yahweh keepeth himself and that wicked one touches him not right so there's a sin that's unto death there's a sin that's not unto death one that's unto death is not forgivable uh, you, you don't pray for it and you might ask yourself well what is that we'll get to that in just a minute but um it is equivalent to presumptuous sin under the old testament under you know the sin that is unto death that you don't pray for that there's no intercession for okay is under the new testament the same thing in principle as the sin that was presumptuous under the old testament there, there was no way to make atonement for it no forgiveness because it rejected yahweh his right to rule or to forgive and so there's a sin unto death and a sin not unto death under the new testament too and it basically boils down to the same principle of sin through ignorance or sin that's defiant, presumptuous. Um, let me see if I can try to think of scriptures. Um, there's a scripture that it's in uh, Matthew 12. Um, and there's more to it than this, but I think if we go down to maybe the 31st verse, we might be able to get the essence of this. What do we have uh, time-wise? About 15 minutes or so? 20 minutes um, left. You here. have 20 minutes left. 21. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. So if you got Matthew 12 there. Yeah, Matthew 12 and verse 31. Yes, sir. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not 
be forgiven unto men. Okay, and so there you go. And it may be in that scripture, another place where he talks about the same thing. And he says, it shall not be forgiven them either in this age, the one he spoke in, which was the age before the one we're in now, he says, or in the next. Yeah, so that's that the next be... verse. Oh, okay, go ahead and read that. Sure, verse 32. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Yep, there you go. Okay. So now, it, in, what is that talking about? You, you can speak against the Son of Man, but not against the Holy Spirit. Now, Yahshua was the Holy Spirit embodied, but he was also the Son of Man. So this sounds kind of confusing, doesn't it? But Son of Man is not a term that absolutely definitely means that it is the Holy Spirit. It's a less, well, it's, like I say, it's not a definite word. It doesn't define the Holy Spirit necessarily. And so Yahshua uh, called himself son of man quite often. And I think part of the reason for it was that uh, during his ministry, if he was just openly calling himself the Holy Spirit, meaning Yahweh in a body, uh, they would have crucified him for blasphemy against Yahweh um, before the time that he was supposed to be crucified. So he was just holding them off. He had certainly the right to say it, but he was avoiding that and he called himself the son of man. I, I believe there is only one place that it says in the Bible that he, during the days of his ministry, called himself the Messiah. And that was when he spoke to the woman of Samaria, who, of course, was not going to uh, convict him with the Jews in Jerusalem. Um, but uh, anyway, that's kind of a, another point, but it's related. And the, the, the idea here is that if you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you know that you're going against Yahweh himself. Now, Somebody may have to help me find this scripture, but this is where Yahshua was crucified, and he's on the cross, and they are mocking him, um, and it's one point where he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Does anybody know where that's at? Luke 23, 34. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Then said Yahshua, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right. Now, if and we back he up. His, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish up. I'm sorry. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Okay. So now, and if we backed up, we'd see that they were mocking him and saying, he's the son of Yahweh. Come on down from that cross. And he saved others. Let him save himself, so forth. And uh, obviously, they do not believe, these people do not believe that he is truly the Messiah, that he is truly the son of Yahweh. Um and Yahshua says, Father, forgive them, but he gave the reason. He said, for they know not what they do. Their sin is through ignorance. They do not understand the full extent of what they are doing or the ramifications of what they are doing. 
So it is forgivable. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not forgivable. And uh, because it reproaches Yahweh, it rejects Yahweh uh, and his right to rule. And so um, that, that I, I think, kind of is one of the important things to keep in mind with respect to sin that is forgivable and unforgivable. There's other examples and other things throughout the scriptures that kind of nail this down and make it pretty clear. Um, there's a, there's a, what does First Timothy, the first chapter and the 13th verse say? First Timothy. Did you say one thirteen? Yeah, it seems like yeah. Seems okay. like that's about. Um, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Okay, so Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's admitting right there that he was a blasphemer. And he was an injurious person, but he received mercy. And the reason he received mercy was because he did it ignorantly. His sin was through ignorance and unbelief. It's not that it wasn't sin, but Yahshua forgave him. And uh, Yahshua used him in, in wonderful ways. But he did this uh, and received mercy because he did it ignorantly, not presumptuously, and he did it in unbelief. He didn't believe that Yahshua was the Messiah. That's why he was persecuting the believers in the assembly uh, that were uh, worshiping Yahshua. And then, of course, Yahshua turned him around. So... That's something to keep in mind. We, we do not want to defy Yahweh. Um, so that's maybe the main point that I guess it was on my mind with respect to this thing with uh, sin. Um, I think Sasha covered a lot of it pretty nicely there. Obviously, there's a lot we could go into. Maybe there's another aspect that we've got just a couple, few minutes for. And so we, we, he, he pointed out absolutely correctly that sin is transgression of the law. And we really need to understand that it's transgression of the law that applies to each person. The law that Yahweh gave to Adam is not transgressible by anybody today. The law that Yahweh gave to the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, uh, that law doesn't apply either to the Jews or us today. And um, so the question is what commandment or what law does apply okay, uh, to transgress? And if you'll go to John, the 13th chapter and the 34th verse, there's one in John 13, 14, and 15. I think we can find them. John 13, 34. Sure. John 13 and 34. Mm -hmm. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that mm -hmm. ye also love one another. Okay, now, this is the night before Yahshua was crucified, and he's uh, giving his apostles these words, uh, and, and it's just <laughs> about the last time, uh, that night is the last time he's going to have a chance to talk to them before he's crucified, buried, raised, and everything is going to be changed by what he does. And he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, under the Old Testament, there were two commandments that uh, are noted that Yahshua cited and others 
uh, confessed. And the first and great commandment was thou shalt love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And the second is like the first, and that is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, this new commandment that Yahshua gives is actually going to be the way it, that second commandment applies in the spirit under the New Testament. Instead of loving, uh, instead of loving um, your neighbor as yourself, um, you're supposed to love one another as Yahshua loved us. And the question is, of course, how is that? Well, if we go to the 14th chapter, the 15th verse, and the 21st and 23rd verses there too. So John 14, it's the next chapter over. And then uh, verse 15, and then 21 through 23. John 14 and 15. Mm-hmm. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this makes a point here that first of all, Yahshua is the one under the New Testament that has the right to rule. He is the ruler. He raised king of kings. So he's the ruler. He gets the right to make the rules, literally. And so, and then he said to them, if you love me, then you keep my commandments, okay? And uh, continue on. We, we've got to go to verse, verse 21. 21. Yep. Yeah. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Mm -hmm. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. Mm -hmm. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him, mm -hmm. Judith saith unto him, not is Iscariot. Yeah, it's not Judas Iscariot. Iscariot. It's the other Judas. Iscariot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yahweh. How it is that yeah, it would actually be master. Yeah, you're reading out of the King James, which is fine. That's absolutely great. It's just you know, what what he he didn't call him Yahweh by name. He called him master. Go ahead. How it is that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us mm -hmm. and not unto the world. Mm -hmm. Yahshua answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. Mm -hmm. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Is that through the 23rd verse? Correct. Okay. So he gives them a new commandment, love one another as Yahshua loved them. And then he talks about the fact that they, if they love him, his father will love them. And he and his father, meaning the Holy Spirit, Yahweh himself, will come into them. When he says, we'll come and make our abode with you. In other words, he as the Holy Spirit will come and live within their heart and their mind. And so they will end up being one. But it, it, you have to love him. So it's not just love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, and might. It's actually we have to love Yahshua. Now that requires two other little things that I won't have time to go into. We have to know him. Because otherwise, if you don't know him and you have love, you have love for a false image of him. People think they know Yahshua when they love Jesus. And they're sincere. They love Jesus. But what they love is a false image of Yahshua. And a false image is an idol. And then you have to believe him. You have to actually believe that he is the Savior. And that really also requires knowing something about how he actually saved us and what he saved us from. And he saved us from sin. He also saved us from Satan. And those that with the Holy Spirit, he will save from the wrath of Yahweh to come. Anyway, so key here is you have to love him. 
If that's the case, the Holy Spirit will be in that person. That is Yahweh or Yahshua himself in that person as the Holy Spirit. Now go over to the 15th chapter. All of this is the night before Yahshua is crucified. And go to the 12th verse through the 17th verse. And I think there might be one other thing that we missed, but that's we'll, we'll mention it if it's not over in 15. John 15 and 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Mm -hmm. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Mm -hmm. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his master does. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit shall remain. Mm -hmm. That whatsoever ye shall ask of my father, of the father in my name, he may give it you. Mm -hmm. These things I command you that you love one another. Mm -hmm. Is that through the 17th verse? Yes. All right, and I see, okay, five minutes. Okay, good. Yeah, we'll be finished here in just a minute. All right, so again, you have to love one another as Yahshua loved us. How is that? He gave himself for us, okay? Love is not just an emotion. In fact, the emotion that people confuse with love oftentimes is lust. But even if there is a genuine feeling of love, true love requires action. And there's a couple of scriptures I'll mention that um, uh, we probably won't have time to read, but uh, one is in Romans 13, um, 8 through 10, and another is in Galatians 5. And then um, that one starts at 13 through 14 and over to the 18th verse. And these confirm that love is the fulfilling of the law and that, um, that that's what is required. And also, if we went to 1 John 3, uh, verse 23 through 24, which I don't think we're necessarily going to have time for. Um, but again, that's his commandment, that we love one another as... Uh, he loved us. We have to believe on Yahshua uh, and love one another. Now, there was another point in my mind, and it just escaped me. Um, and I know we don't have much time. So let me see. There was. Well, I guess um, I, it's OK. What's that? Somebody gonna say all something? love in the end. It is. It's all love, and the love has to be real. Oh, and I was talking about the fact that love requires action. Oh, it is in. Uh, it's in First John three. Let me see if I can find the verse. Um, First John the third chapter. He read verse four uh, that love is, or that uh, sin is the transgression of the law. And then uh, I think if we go to verse 10, verse 14, those verses, verse 10 and verse 14. Sure. Um, verse 10. In this, the children of Yahweh are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Neither he that loveth, not his brother. Right. Um, and then 14? did you want me to drop down to? to yeah, 14. to 14. Mm -hmm. We know that we have not passed from death Whoops. on. We know right. that we have passed. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. We know that we have passed from death onto life. Excuse me. Because we love the brethren. Right. He that loveth 
not his brother abideth in death. Mm -hmm. Um, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in you. Right. I think if I drop down to 20. Yeah, no, well, just continue on because I'm not sure where the next verse is. It's where he, it's basically where he talks about the fact that if you see uh, your brother have need and you shut your bowels of compassion up uh, of how dwells the love of Yahweh in him. In other okay. words, it, yep. love, love requires acting on things reasonably. And I know the time is up. So if you got the verse, you can mention it and then I'll be quiet. I'm done. Sure. Um, verse 17, but whoso hath this world good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of Yahweh in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Mm-hmm. There you go. So it's not just talk, but it's action, deed, and truth. Thank you. Praise Yahshua. Thank you very much, Dr. Welch. Uh, we'd like to thank, thank everyone for attending our Zoom class this evening. We hold classes every Tuesday on Zoom from 7 to 9 p.m. In persons on Friday from 7 to 9 p.m. Although this July 4th, we will not be having a Zoom. We will be having an in-person class on Tuesday, July 6th at 6 p.m. Um, and I'd like to dismiss with the doxology taken from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.